How does magic work? Magic is an agreement between the shaitan on one side and the magician on the other. The magician agrees to do certain things for the shaitan and then of course the shaitan agrees in return to do certain things for the magician. So let's start by looking at the cave. This one is fine. This one's not going to upset anybody, inshallah. And uh, there's nothing in here that's going to be particularly um, horrible. And as I said, I'm going to try and avoid the worst of them because I did have people fainting in previous uh, lectures. Okay. Really? So you see, this person has made a circle and they've created an altar at the front. The altar has magical symbols in it and symbolism. Each single symbol has a purpose. Each color of each candle has a purpose. You can see in there, there is a, a little shrine at the front with a triangle. And the use of the circle and the triangle is going to come later on. You'll see that very clearly. Each of those candles has a purpose and a reason. And what this person would be commanded to do would be to sit inside of the circle for a prolonged period of time in a cave. And this is just showing you the cave in which the person would be sitting. They're going to a place known for the possession of the jinn known to be isolated they're sitting inside of that cave and then they are going to be sitting for such a prolonged period of time lighting the candles and beginning to mention the name of the shaitan call upon the shaitan mm -hmm. and invite the shaitan to come to their presence and they would usually be asked to relieve themselves in the same circle that they sit in and to sit in their own filth yeah. But that's the lightest one. I thought I'd test your, you know, your stomach first of all. <laughs> that's the lightest one. Now let's go and have a look at what magicians do with the Quran. This is a public sewer. It's full of, you know, waste and excrement. And they're trying to fish out something from the public sewer. And we're going to keep going. And the Shaykh, he climbs down into it. And this is what they pulled out of the public sewer. As you can see, this is a copy of the Quran that has been used in a public sewer. It's is covered in human filth. His hands? It's covered in sewage. No gloves. And they now have to clean and purify this copy of the Quran. Just in case you thought that was a one-off, we'll show you another video. This one has 51 copies of the Mus'haf that have been disgraced by the magicians. As you can see, they are covered. These are all copies of the Quran. They are covered in knots. They are covered in filth inside of them. They're going to open one of them up. They're covered in pins like voodoo dolls. They're cutting them open and you see the state of the Mus'haf inside. You can see the color of the water that is coming off of the, the uh, copies of the Qur'an as they're washing them, as they're opening them. And they're washing them with uh, rose water and they're washing them with uh, perfume in order to, to remove the, the uh, excrement that was on them. And they were found in a toilet, in a public sewer. Hmm. 51 copies of the Mus'haf. Oh. And you can see inside the state that these uh, Masahif have been put in. And inside there are metal nails uh, bent over. These are part of the magic. And you can see how covered these uh, Masahif are in, uh, in, in dirt and in, in uncleanliness. Right. What you can see here is a copy of the Quran. And you can see a, a circular, I don't know what to call it, a device. And you can see what the Qur'an is smeared with. The story of this is actually much, much worse. Whatever you can imagine, the story is worse. There was a, a maid who wanted to perform uh, magic upon the family that she was with. She took a copy of the Qur'an, she placed it into this tube, and she placed it where she placed it uh, when she was on her monthly cycle and she covered the Qur'an in menstrual blood. Uh. 
This is what magicians do. Here we're going to see another magician. And this magician is going to show how he, again he's been caught. And part of them being caught is they ask them to sh they they ask them to show what it was that they were doing without letting them make shit. They don't let them call upon the shaitan, but they just let them show the idea of what they were doing in order to expose them in front of the people. So the first thing you see is that this man is wearing red from head okay. to toe. Yeah, he's wearing red from head to toe because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi forbade a man from wearing red from head to toe. He lights his oh, incense underway. that is done deliberately. To bring the shaitan, it's not. It's a kind of incense that's well associated with the shaitan, and he begins to perfume a whip, and he starts to whip himself. This might remind you of some people. <laughs> and I'll make no further comment than that. Now, what you can hmm. see there is curtains on the wall that again he has disobeyed the Prophet Sallallahu by placing curtains all over the wall, and. What you see here is blood stains on the curtains. Now what he would do is he would sacrifice a rooster. The rooster that's associated with the calling of the people to the Fajr prayer. They would sacrifice a rooster to other than Allah. To sacrifice a rooster to the shaitan and then allow it to flap around the room spreading the blood all over the walls. And then you would see what this person would do. They have some more little tools that they use. They would then lie in a position of humility and a position of, uh, of lowliness. And you're going to see. And they would stay in that position calling upon the shaitan. Calling upon the shaitan to appear before them, calling upon the shaitan to help them, calling upon the shaitan to aid them and to support them. And what they do is they make a contract between themselves and between the shaitan. And this contract is then placed in a number of places. And I'm going to show you some examples. This here is a bird that was confiscated from the house of a magician. And you can see stitched into its wing or onto its tail. I've got all sorts of them, this one. That's stitched onto its wing. You have uh, either a, a, a written uh, piece of paper with the magic written on it, or you have no. various strings and threads that have been blown, the magic has been blown over them. I think the other one is a little clearer, so I'll put the other one on. So this is another, uh, another bird that was confiscated from the house of a magician. And you can see very, very clearly there that it has stitched into its wing uh, a contract that is written between the magician and between the shaitan. I wonder why they put on a bird. I wonder what that means. You also have an example of they're burying the magic in the graves. So they go out to a grave and they dig inside the grave. They've caught a magician or they've been informed by a magician as to where the magic is hidden. And you're going to see that they bring out from the grave. They've been told what side of the grave to look at and they bring out usually a plastic bag and the bag has various magical items in it. You can see there that you have uh, the letters and the symbols that we're going to talk about tomorrow and you're going to learn about what all about what they those symbols and letters mean I'll show you another one that comes out of the grave this is right in the base of the grave in the middle of the night they call them out because they've uh, heard that there's some magic buried there and they keep on digging and digging and eventually they take out this pouch they start to open the pouch and we're going to see what's in it Ooh. 
What is that? That looks like somebody's vest. Inside you have an egg, which is painted egg. or colored red. May oh. well be blood. It okay, has a number so. of needles stuck into it. You have um, a tissue, a man's tissue. You have a lemon. You have the head of an animal that was sacrificed to other than Allah. That's messed up. And it's not uncommon for them to put inside of the head of the animal some magic. And you have these writings, uh, you have all sorts, it's covered in blood. You have um, a child's nappy in there. And you have a sanitary towel. And there's uh, some Quran in there as well. And we're going to count the number of pins. You can see in there that there are seven pins. Okay, let's try and analyze a little bit of what we've seen. Mm -hmm. Each individual item that was put in there was put in there for a reason. Magicians don't do things at random. They do very, very evil and very horrific things, but they don't do them at random. It was put in there for a reason and an aim in order to bring the shaitan and cause a problem. And I'll tell you what happened. The, the story of this, the sheikh who, who gave me the video, he actually was involved in the case and he told me the story. He said, what happened was, there was a woman who had been divorced by her husband and she had lost custody of her child. She went to a magician in order to bring her child back to her. She brought her own blood. She brought the child's nappy. She brought some clothing from her husband and his tissue. And she brought um, an animal and the animal was slaughtered to other than Allah. And I want to make something very, very, very clear. The magician in the beginning would do these horrible acts and they would leave Islam and, and they would, you know, they would sell their soul to the shaitan. However, there's a problem. Once the magician has done that, what's next? The magician says, calls the shaitan, says, I'm willing to make sajda to you in order for me, you to do something for me. And the jinn and the shaitan say, well, what's the point? You've already disgraced the Qur'an, you've already left Islam, you've already done the worst of the worst of the worst. There's nothing left to ask from you. So then he says, what can I do for you next to make you carry out my orders once again? And so the shaitan says, now you have to bring other people. It's not enough for you to mm. leave Islam. Now you have to bring other people. And other so that people. magician goes out to convince other people to use their services and to bring them, those other people, outside of Islam. And this is something that you see amongst the magicians, is that they don't simply disbelieve. They disbelieve and they become a da'iyah, a caller to get people to leave Islam. And so that woman was asked to bring an animal knowing that animal would be sacrificed to other than Allah. In the beginning, don't think that this magician sat there with horns, you know, like and sat there saying, I'm an evil magician. In the beginning, the magician enticed her, look, I can solve your problem, I'm a healer. But when it comes to the crunch, you're going to have to bring me an animal to be sacrificed. She knows and he knows that animal is going to be sacrificed to other than Allah. When he asks her to bring a sanitary towel, he asks her to bring a nappy, she knows what's going to be done with it. Mm -hmm. But he has to get her to make that step so that she would leave Islam. And when she leaves Islam, then the jinn will now do another act for him and would afflict her husband and cause him to lose the custody of his child and for the child to go back to the mother or afflict the husband to make him love the woman again. And of course, it should be mentioned that they never bring anything good. And they never, ever, ever are successful in what they do. 
The mag magician will never be successful wherever they are. And the husband would go insane, fall in love with his wife once again, go back to his wife. Within a few months, he will have fallen out with her again. Hmm. It doesn't bring anything but evil for everybody. It doesn't bring people back together. Hmm. Okay. Deep look into magic. It's got a long story short. I started to do business in uh, Sierra Leone. Right. And then this was my friends. They used to do sihr, but they never used to call it sihr or magic. They actually thought that this was a part of Islam. So hmm. and I know there's differences of opinion here and there about amulets and things like that. But they used to have amulets and they used to think that there was Quran inside these amulets. But in reality, it wasn't. It was it was sihr. You know, I opened one of these amulets once and it's just numbers and uh, names of like shayateen and things like this. Horrible things, bro. And they used to believe that these things protect them from the police. Right? From the police. From the police, right? Because they used to do certain things. And they actually gave me one of these things to protect myself from the police. Right? And I'll be I I carried it for maybe two years, bro, in my pocket. I carried this amulet. That was like a wallet mm. or something or a phone mm. to you. Yeah, bro. It was constantly in my pocket. It was like a small amulet. At the time, I didn't know what was inside, right? But these Africans just said, look, this is going to protect you from this, that, and the other. And I'm like, I wasn't, I didn't believe in anything, right? I'm like, okay, just put it in my pocket. But bro, you know, Shaitan, he does things to make you believe that that's protecting you. So I remember one time I got pulled in Sierra Leone. The policeman pulled me, right? And he pulled out all the things in my pocket and he pulled this thing out and he went like this, <gasps> right? And it's like the thing burnt him, bro. And he said, no, no, take, take your things. And he gave him all my things back oh, and then wait. I went. So I'm wow. now starting to get a man in this thing. I don't realize that it's not the thing that burnt him, right? Shaitan wants me to have Iman that this thing is protecting me from police. Yeah. So Shaitan came and maybe touched him or pinched him or flicked him or hit him or whispered to him. I don't know. But the bottom line was that Shaitan scared this policeman and I attributed that incident to this thing. Do you understand? Yeah. And this happened about three or four times, bro. Oh, no. Like another policeman once, he pulled me. Uh, and the same thing happened, bro. The same thing is like, ah. Yeah. So anyone who doesn't have knowledge starts to have a man in these amulets thinking that, oh, so, you know, I'm getting power now. You know, I can just buy one of these amulets. I can do what I want. I can go and steal. I can do any crime I want. I can sell drugs, yeah. whatever it is, because they, they're starting to have a man. They're starting to do shirk. And to a certain extent, shaitan, will assist. And Allah, oh, of course, you have to understand that this is all with the permission of Allah. Nothing can happen without the permission of Allah. Yeah. But Allah allows, sometimes allows evil things to happen because there's wisdom. You are mis literally misguiding yourself. Does that make sense? So, bro, I've seen this many, many times, right? There's many stories. I don't like to go too much into it because the point's been made. But this is how... SubhanAllah, I, I, it was the beginning of kind of starting to have Iman mm. and belief in these, these false things. Another time I went to the northern parts of Sierra Leone uh, in the jungle, it's called Kabbalah, Kabbalah, right? <laughs> and it's known as a city for Sihr. And it's very evil, bro. There's literally magicians sat in the jungle. And there's people queuing to see these magicians. Now, of course, they don't call them the magicians. They call them the sheikh. And they look like Muslims. They have beards. They they dress like Muslims. They have the Quran. They have uh, you know beads. They have the hat. They look like a sheikh. And maybe they're knowledgeable. Maybe they know Arabic. Maybe they even memorize Quran. But somewhere along the line, they've learned about sihr, and they're dealing with the jinn. And I've seen this, bro. You know, I've seen them. Uh, you know, they would say that they're speaking to this jinn, they're speaking to that jinn, they, they, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. And people will, will come with different problems 
and try to get the magician to deal with that issue. So if you have a court case or if you have an exam or if you have any issue in your life, uh, maybe you, you, you're having an issue with uh, you can't have children or maybe you want to marry somebody. Any of these issues, these so-called magicians can fix it for you. But it's haram, bro, and it's shirk. And it's just fooling people. But people don't realize that when they get involved in these things, it takes you outside of Islam, bro. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this was kind of a very important point to me. And then when I came back from Sierra Leone to, to England, I spoke to my Libyan friend and I said, look, you Muslims, you've got power. You know, I seen this happen. This Muslim gave me this thing and the policeman ran away and this other Muslim did this. And, and my friend said, no, 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 this is haram. This is shirk. What are you doing? And I'm like, well, I'm not a Muslim. He said, no, no, I, we believe it's true. We believe these things can happen, but it's haram in Islam. So I was like, what do you mean? So he sat me down and he showed me a video by Dr. Bilal Phillips. So that same mm. night when I oh, watched this lecture by Dr. Bilal Phillips, my friend gave me a copy of the fortress of a Muslim. You know, the small yeah, uh, book yeah. of duas. Some of them are ayah from the Quran and some of them are hadith. Yeah. Now we know that both are wahi, right? Of course, you know, you know, and you know, but of course, the Quran is a as an extra status, right? Definitely, because it's kitab Allah, yeah. And I was saying to my friend, this is different. This one is different from this, like, and and he said, yeah, that's the Quran, that's the Hadith. And then I'll turn the page, I'd read that, and I'd read, and every time the 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 ayah from the Quran, I just felt that it's different, bro. And I'm reading it in English, bro. Subhanallah. Right. So I got onto one ayah. You mean the transliteration or the translation? Translation and the transliteration. Okay. It's got the Arabic, the transliteration. And you just felt like it's different. And, 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 the, and the English, right? But even in the English, bro, I was like, this is different to that, right? And subhanAllah, bro, I, when I, um, I got to Surah Falak, right? And it speaks about, you know, those who are envious, they're blowing in knots, tying knots, you know, at the daybreak, etc. I, I started crying, bro, because... I'd witnessed this in Sierra Leone. Wow. I'd seen them rolling, literally, these Tawiz things with Sihar in. They were naked, bro. Uh, literally sat in the river, rolling the, the Sihar. Literally, sometimes they would do it like what I now know to be sunset time. And sometimes they do it at sunrise, bro. And they're making the Sihar and they're blowing, bro. SubhanAllah, I seen it, bro. And that ayah was the one that really sealed it for me. I said, this is the protection from this. And that's when I started to put my iman now in this little book. So I moved it from the Taoist thing and I started to now, this, this little book went everywhere with me, bro. I was just reading the du'as, all the du'as, everything, you know, and that became the protection. Dum, 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 ba, ba, ba.